Wow. Am I, is my mic on? Are we good? Can you hear me okay? Yeah. Great stuff. Such a privilege to be here, guys. I, um, I'm dumbfounded by your worship. I just really, really enjoyed that. Really enjoyed that. I thought it was never going to end, which I was glad about. It's just brilliant. Absolutely brilliant. So we're going to be delving into the Word today. I hope you've got your Bibles with you. Don't worry if not, because I've produced a PowerPoint, which is great. Okay, I'm going to time myself so I don't overrun, which is uh, a good thing. Um, okay, so the first slide, if you could put that up. Now, many of you, or some of you, might be colorblind. I'm not so sure. So um, the way you know is you look at uh, a particular image, and um, you can see whether, whether you can see numbers in those images. So it might, might be up there. Don't worry if it's not. Okay, but... If you're colorblind, you cannot appreciate a child's crayon drawing. Or maybe you don't really appreciate a sunset. But you never know that there is an issue because you don't really know what a sunset looks like. And you may be completely unaware of this. So have a look at those. See if you can pick out the numbers in there. So it's more serious, isn't it? It's more serious if you can't distinguish a red stop light when you're driving. Or a green for that. Okay? So maybe some of you get in revelation that you're colorblind today. <laughs> I was testing myself while I was producing this. See, colorblindness is a great analogy for spiritual blindness. And we might say, well, I'm born again. I'm not spiritually blind. But actually, we can all still have blind areas in our spiritual walk. So someone who suffers with color blindness can get on fine in life but you, and you don't actually miss those colors that you've never seen but you're missing vital parts of obvious things around you and sin is the same we can be blind to the depths and extent of our internal sin yet others can see it and that's the beautiful thing about being married my wife sees my sin better than I do I'm blind to it in many respects. And we're all blind in different extents, aren't we? I want to talk about a man in just that condition. Okay, in the Bible. Now this man, you might think, is this a man who would be chosen by God? So this guy was a soldier. He was a violent man. He committed murder. And he kidnapped people. Is he a, a prime candidate for salvation? Possibly not. Let's, let's, let's listen about it. Let's read about him. Okay, this is 2 Kings, chapter 5, verses 1 to 17. Now, Naaman was a commander of the king of Aram. He was a great man in the sight of his master and highly regarded because through him the Lord had given victory to Aram. He was a valiant soldier, but he had leprosy. Now, bands of raiders from Aram had gone out and taken captive a young girl from Israel and she served Naaman's wife. She said to her mistress, which is really nice of her when you think about it, if only my master would see the prophet who is in Samaria, he would cure him of his leprosy. So Naaman went to his master and, and told him what the girl from Israel had said and the king said, by all means go. I will send a letter to the king of Israel. So Naaman left, taking with him ten talents of silver, six thousand shekels of gold, ten sets of clothing. Can you imagine what that was, getting the size right and everything? The letter that he took to the king of Israel read, With this letter, I'm sending my servant Naaman to you, so that you may cure him of his leprosy. As soon as the king of Israel read the letter, he tore his clothes. He was upset. Am I God, he says? Can I kill and bring back to life? Why does this fellow send someone to me to be cured of his leprosy? See how he's trying to pick a quarrel with me. When Elisha, the man of God, heard that the king of Israel had torn his robes, he sent him this message. Why have you torn your robes? Have the man come to me. I love this boldness. And he will know there is a prophet in Israel. So Naaman went with his horses and chariots and stopped at the door of Elisha's house. Elisha sent a message to say to him, Go, 
wash seven times in the Jordan and your flesh will be restored and you will be cleansed. But Naaman went away angry and said, I thought, isn't this hilarious, I thought he would come out to me and stand and call on the name of the Lord his God, wave his hand over the spot and cure me of my leprosy. Are not Abama and Parfa, the rivers of Damascus, better than all of these waters of Israel? Couldn't I wash in them and be cleansed? So he turned and went off in a rage. Naaman's servants went to him. Remember, it's the servants who have the wisdom in the story. My father, if the prophet had told you to do some great thing, would you have not done it? How much more then when he tells you, wash and be cleansed? So he went and he dipped himself in the Jordan seven times, as the man of God, man of God had told him. And his flesh was restored and became clean like that of a young boy. Then Naaman and all his attendants went back to the man of God. He stood before him and said, Now I know there is no God in all the world except in Israel. So please accept a gift from your servant. The prophet answered, As surely as the Lord lives, whom I serve, I will not accept a thing. And even though Naaman urged him, he refused. If you will not, said Naaman, please let me, your servant, be giving as much earth as a mule, a pair of mules can carry, for your servant will never again make burnt offerings and sacrifices to any other God but the Lord. Isn't that an amazing story? I just love Elisha's ministry and what he gets up to. He just says it like it is and does things which are incredible. So, what are the points we're going to bring out from this? So, we're going to look at what Elisha's sickness was. We're going to look at what is the cure for his sickness. And we're going to look at what was his response. What was Naaman's response? What was Naaman's sickness? What was his cure? And what was his response? I think we can learn a lot today. Have we got our ears open? Great stuff. Okay, so what is his sickness? I find this fascinating because it's obvious what his sickness is, isn't it? He's got leprosy. He's got a, a major skin disorder, which is obvious for everybody to see. But if you know your Gospels well, you know when Jesus walked around in Israel... He would speak to blind people and others, and they would say to him, Lord, heal me. And Jesus would come up to them and said, what can I do for you? Isn't that interesting? Isn't it obvious? I want to see. But Jesus doesn't see things the way we see our things, isn't it? He sees internally why we might see externally. And sin is the real paralysis of the heart. All of our brokenness is due to sin. Sin we have committed. Sin committed against us and being part of a sinful world. Now in this story, the outer bro brokenness of Naaman, his leprosy, be becomes the occasion to deal with his inner brokenness. So what is Naaman's inner brokenness that is destroying his life? He looks strong, doesn't he? He looks rich. He's successful. He's very good at what he does. Look at the story. But time and time again, in this amazing story, through Elisha, Naaman is ignored and humbled. Have you noticed? He goes to Elisha's house. How, how rude is this? This amazing, famous man goes to Elisha's house, and Elisha won't even come to the door. But he sends a servant to him with a message. He's treated... Completely the opposite of how he should have been treated. Maybe that's you today. Maybe you, in some context, are being treated the opposite of where you think you should be treated and you're insulted. I want us to look a bit deeper today. It's so insulting for Naaman and he was insulted. And at that time, Naaman would have been one of the most important people in the world, arriving with hundreds, literally hundreds of thousands of pounds worth of gifts, and he's treated shoddily. But God arranges this treatment. Isn't that interesting? God arranges for Naaman to be insulted. <laughs> because God, I don't know whether, I'm sure you know God so well, but he is so infinitely wise, he knows how to get you to have a glimpse of yourself. Do you know that? See, Naaman's inner brokenness is pride. 
He's proud, he's self-sufficient, he believes he can buy anything, and his status is good enough to get anything. So like many of us in the West, that's what we believe. I can get anything, I can do anything. It's kind of inbuilt in us, isn't it, from, a, from as we we're young. And God knows this man and how to deal with this man. His outer leprosy was an opportunity for his, his inner leprosy to be dealt with. He was colorblind to his pride. But this was his time, and he didn't know it. His outer condition was far less dangerous than his in, inner condition. Leprosy was a terrible disease, and still is. But especially in these, these days, there was no cure, and it was awful. And Naaman knew his days were numbered. But he didn't recognize what was going on on the inside, which was far more serious. His inner leprosy is pride. And the treatment for pride is humility. So again and again, Naaman is humiliated. Now what do you do when you get humiliated? I don't like humiliation. I'm sure you don't like it. And what happens to me is I get hot. <laughs> I start to get hot from the bottom up. And I get angry, just like Naaman gets angry. Would we start to learn to look for God's teaching in each and every situation? See, we all grow up, don't we, saying or being taught, I know what's best. I can handle life. I know the right way. But when we start to learn about God, if you belong to God, what you'll, you'll have noticed is he starts to bring things from the outside to come and expose our blindness for our good. And his glory. Each one of us from our youngest years have to protect that image that we think we are in control. Don't we? It's hidden insecurity due to our sin. And God wants to challenge it for our good. And it's a good thing even though it heats us up and it feels awful. So what is the cure? What is this illness? Pride. What is the cure? So God brings an insult to us all, okay? Tim Keller, one of my heroes, says these words, that we are far more, I'm sure you've heard this, that we are far more sinful than we ever imagined. That is over all of humanity. And many people in my wider family are insulted by that. That we are far more sinful than we ever imagined. But, and it's that but which, ch which turns it on its head. But also that we are far more loved than we can ever dream of. Isn't that great? One, an amazing insult to the human race, but it's true. The other one, an incredible blessing of pure grace. And this can be a lifelong revelation. I've been saved now for possibly 30 years. And um, I'm just starting to revelation of just how sinful I am, what goes on in my inner man, yet how incredibly loved I am by God. Are you, are you receiving that? Are you learning that from God? But like Naaman, can we agree with God's diagnosis over us? We have to agree with him. He's always right. Or pride will rise up in anger and we'll walk away. Naaman nearly walked away from his healing. And yet he was going to be healed of something far greater. See, the message of the gospel works on all of our inner leprosy. It works in three ways. See, let's have a look at the story again. The cure is simple. What is the cure for Naaman? Just wash. Don't do anything magnificent. Just be obedient and wash in this particular river. It's not sensational or elaborate. It's just... Like the gospel. What is the gospel today? Repent and believe. Okay, it's just the same. Cure is simple. Just wash. And now the, the gospel is repent and believe. And yet for us humans, we love to get busy, don't we? We love to perform. We love to receive wages because I've earned them. Free gifts are viewed with a bit of suspicion, aren't they? And many of us 
struggle to receive a gift at Christmas, especially a big one, because we think, oh, uh, you spent that much on me? I suppose uh, I better up my, uh, my gift giving next year and spend the same on you. Because we like to pay our way. So that at the end, why do we like to pay our way? So that at the end we say, I'm not in any debt to anybody. I'm in control. But God has to show us we are in deep debt to him. The cure not only is simple, the cure is free. This is not what Naaman expected to go when he came to Israel. He'd come with a whole load of money and some fine clothes because he was willing to pay his way. So he brought huge amounts of money. He didn't want, or he didn't need charity. He brought a royal letter. God would have to heal him. He was placing God, God in his debt. Just wash is insulting. You know who I am, he was saying. And we believe we have to do some great thing for God to be saved sometimes, don't we? But Elisha was directing Naaman to do something any person could do. Just wash. It was as if Elisha didn't know who this great man was. He wouldn't even get out of his chair in his front room while he was watching the television. All of his exploits... All of this man's reputation made no difference. He was playing it perfectly for Naaman to be rescued. He was treating him like any old person. Anyone could do this. Nothing about Naaman mattered. And that's the same with us today. Nothing about any of our past matters when it comes to the gospel. We can come to him and have that free salvation of his And be obedient to him and say, Lord, I want you. Thank you for your salvation. We agree with his diagnosis over us. Romans 3 says, all have sinned and fallen short of the gospel of God. All have sinned. All have sinned. Amazing, isn't it? That's that's the diagnosis over the human race. But the cure is simple. Repent of your sin, and believe the good news of Jesus Christ, that he has paid your sin, paid for your sin upon himself. He became sin for you, that you might be rescued. But Naaman was angry. Though the cure was simple, the cure was free, and the cure was exclusive. This is something for our culture, isn't it? The cure was exclusive. You see, Naaman was offended, and we can be offended. Especially if you go into the center of Sheffield today, I'm sure if you said that Jesus is the only way, people would be offended. How can he be the only way? There's many ways to God. But Naaman was, ex- was offended. Hey, there's, there's many rivers, there's nice rivers here in, 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 in my country. That, there are better rivers than that dirty one there. Just like today, there are many gods, many ways to God. Don't tell me this one way is right. Yet, Our gospel is exclusive because it's simple and free. And because it's simpler and free, it's exclusive. If people say good and generous, loving people get to heaven, then that isn't inclusive. Because I'm not good and and simple and free, you know? I'm not a good person. So I won't get to heaven if you're just excluding good people. What about me? Or the person who has wrecked their life or who's morally disabled. Can they not get to heaven because they're not good? But rather, our gospel is free and available to all. So far from being exclusive, it's incredibly inclusive. We all know that some great thing has to be done to win us back to God. And we, we know that God is holy and great because he has to be. But so often we believe we are the ones who can achieve for God. We don't realize we're so sinful to the core, full of pride. We're colorblind spiritually. It takes God to come to us like Naaman and show us. But then how do we respond? I do hope you've responded to God over this. The initial response is to say, Lord, please come and save me. Rescue me for myself. But then as we go on as Christians, through the decades, 
sin rises up again. We see ourselves. We, we can walk in the flesh. We can do, make wrong decisions. How do we respond then? Do we respond like Naaman and say, oh, no, I want to be in control. Or do we say, Lord, you are the Lord of all. I surrender to you. I agree with your diagnosis over my life. Suddenly we see that someone has done that great thing for us on our behalf. Through Jesus, our inner leprosy was placed upon him. Isn't that good news? So what is our response as a last point? What, is that, what was his response? What was Naaman's response as an example? Instead of achieving, of which he wanted to do, he decided he was just going to receive. And what happened? He did exactly what Elisha told him to do. God directed him to go and bathe in that river, to do exactly that in that particular river, specific guidelines, and he did. And what happened? His skin was made new, like a child's skin. Can you imagine how much joy that man had? And then suddenly his inner man understood he was born again. It's just like when we receive the gospel, isn't it? His pride was being dealt with at that moment and would have been continually being dealt with. His thinking had changed. His worldview had changed. Wow. Amazing. Can you remember the day that happened? Some, some of you do. Some, some come slowly into the kingdom. But some of us come fast into the kingdom, don't we? Where there is massive change immediately. His worldview changed, and this is becoming a Christian. We are at the beginning of a total inner transformation. Suddenly he sees, and as we continue to follow the Lord, we continue to discover more perfect sight. Our color blindness is healed. And so he says the words, your servant, suddenly. God is now his master, just like that. He's not after a God who's a partner or a butler. And we can do that, can't we, as Christians? We can say that God, yeah, God is my Lord, but we treat him as if he's my partner. That he will help me out when times are bad. He will, he will, he will do certain things for me. He'll, I'm sure he'll give me that promotion. But what if he doesn't? Are you going to walk away from him? When Victoria got bouts of cancer, when our granddaughter had a major heart issue and had to go in for, for surgery at such a, a young age. God came to me, kind of, and came to Victoria. And it was as if he was saying, okay, what are you going to do now? Are you going to walk away or are you going to stay with me and let me take you through this? But what a privilege to go through dark times with our God. Then we get to know whether we follow him as a butler or whether we follow him as our master. I'm sure you've had those times too. It's where the rubber hits the road, isn't it? God can ask us for anything and we should say yes. It depends who we think he is. Is God your master today or is he your housekeeper? He also says when he's going back to his city that he's going to take the gospel, this is Naaman, going to take the gospel back to his fellow men because God is now his real God. God is now his Lord. So he goes back with, with loads of, of, of earth. It sounds strange, doesn't it? He goes like loads of earth that he's going to pray on in his home city. Basically, he was going back as adding yeast to the bread. He was going to transform that place. I'd love to know the rest of the story of what happened to Naaman. What happened in that city when he went back? This man of influence. And there are men of, and women of influence in this place here who are also going to get saved. And they're going to go back into those, those blocks over there and those houses, and they're going to change their areas because of what you say to them and how you love them. See, the gospel, if allowed, will, I, will it affect our entire life? Is it affecting your entire life today? I'm sure you're allowing it to happen. If not, please do. There's nothing like the gospel of Christ. His Holy Spirit in you can change everything. Can you hear me today? He can change every area of your life. If you allow him to. You see, he's a gentleman. The Holy Spirit is a gentleman. And he will only do what you allow him to do. He will knock on your door 
but you have to let him in to every area. Okay? So as believers, we can refuse to accept the diagnosis. Is there something in your life today that you long to be free of? Like Naaman. Maybe it's a physical condition. It, it was for the Apostle Paul. He had a thorn in the flesh, didn't he, during his ministry? There was troubles. He longed to be free of it, but God kept it in his life to give him humility. What is it for you today that God might be keeping in your life to bring humility? Maybe it's a person in the church, would you believe? <laughs> Maybe it's a boss who can be so frustrating. I love being self-employed because I can only answer to myself. <laughs> but then God comes along and speaks to me through Victoria. And I, uh, I, I, I suddenly wake up to myself. But if you've got a boss, if you work with other people, man, it must be difficult. <laughs> but God will use that. He will use that to mature you, to make you more like him. He can, you know, God just doesn't dwell in this room, you know. You know this. He is where, he's, sometimes he's more where you work than where we worship because he, want, he longs to impact your work colleagues so much. Maybe your school teachers. He longs to impact your school and the frustrations that are in that school. He longs to do powerful things amongst you in the five days of the week. So if you belong to God, he may very well be leaving you in this very thing in your life for your good and his glory. Isn't that good? Well, it's, it's not good, is it? But it is good, ultimately, because he is so, he is so good. He is so good, and he wants to illuminate the real issue, our hidden blindness to our own sin. He is so glorious, he's able to do this by his Holy Spirit. If we let him. Can we agree on something today? That we allow him to have access. To all of the rooms of our heart. All the parts of our life. Can we just close our eyes and just imagine our lives. You know what you do on a day to day basis. You know as you drive to work. You know maybe the thoughts that come across your mind. I want you to invite him into those thoughts. I want you to invite him into your struggles at the moment. Maybe you're struggling with debt. Maybe you're struggling in your marriage. Maybe you're lonely. I want you to right now invite him in. Just even say this, the simple words of, Lord, come into my pain. He wants to make that difference. He wants to transform that thing that has seemingly been there for so, so, so so many years. It all tracks back to our humility, just like it was for Naaman. Just like it was for him. I'm going to read to you one last verse, one of the greatest verses, I think, in the Bible, if I can find it. Keep your eyes closed, and then you won't be exposed to my losing my notes. There we go. Ephesians 1, verses 17 to 19. What a powerful verse this is. Let me pray this over you. I keep asking that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the glorious Father, may give you the spirit of wisdom and revelation. That's what he gave Naaman. So that you may know him better. Does anybody want to know God better in this room? I pray that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened in order that you may know the hope to which he has called you, the riches of his glorious inheritance in his holy people, and his incomparably great power for us who believe. Let's just, I don't know whether the band wants to come up, but let's just keep our eyes closed for a minute. Last night, I couldn't sleep, basically, I did mention it yesterday, but our neighbours can be quite troublesome. And um, sometimes the guy who lives next door has his girlfriend over, and she's got a son who's got severe autism. And um, incredibly enough, they, they go up to the top room and put music on really loud. And then their son goes in the room downstairs, and, and 
he gets a bit distressed by that music, so he starts kicking the wall. So at one o'clock in the morning, the, the wall feels like it's coming down last night. And I wake up, obviously I'm a light sleeper. And, um, and I'm so frustrated. And I pray for that boy, but obviously it doesn't stop. Uh, but then I think, okay, let's turn this into prayer. Lord, what do you want to pray about? And then this preach comes up. And I think, oh Lord, uh, have I got the right preach for, for this church today? And I sense the Holy Spirit say, yes. And he says, why? And, it, and I start to say, okay, talk to me, Lord. This is beautiful. You're taking a terrible situation and making it into a good one. This is good. Basically, I think what the God wants to say to you as a body of people is, he's so pleased with what you're doing, that you're open-hearted, that you're doing such wonderful work in the community, that you are breaking ground on this place in Jordan Thorpe. What an incredible thing. And what incredible worship this morning. So, so, so beautiful. But he wants you to be aware that as you go out, as you start that, that other building, as you do other things, as, as you find the money coming in, as you break forward, what's going to happen is, as what happens so, and we've seen it in our church, so happens with churches is that this unity starts to come out. People yearning for their voice to be heard. People grabbing and pushing. People arguing and saying, I want a piece of this. I, I should be heard. I should this. I should that. And I, This is why God brought this word to you today. It's because it's about humility. I want to pray over this church that you stay in a unified heart. Can you agree with me today? I know it's a tough thing. But in the years ahead, as God does amazing things, and he's going to do amazing things with this church. I'm so impressed. My goodness, I'm so impressed. But please be careful. I want you to respect your leaders. Please respect your leaders. They're here for your good and your blessing. Okay? Please respect them. They want your good. You might disagree with them sometimes, and that's fine, but pray for them. Okay? Okay? And you leaders, it's a tough job. Have patience with the congregation, with those you lead. Have patience with you. Pray for your congregation so that the Holy Spirit might have incredible freedom in this place. He wants to do so much, but the one thing that will block the blessing flow of the Holy Spirit is disunity. We know that. We've seen it time again in the church throughout history. Disunity breaks the power of the Holy Spirit. So far. That's right. Amen. Father God, we pray that those of us in here who maybe have a heart that complains, I pray, God, would you just touch them right now? Father, would you touch them right now, Lord? That it may be, again, a little bit like the story of Mary and Martha. One was always doing, one was receiving. Let us be people who receive and then do, not do, 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 and then get frustrated with everybody else. I've seen it in my church years ago, and I was one of the culprits. Don't do it, please, guys. Let's stay in the flow of the Spirit. God's going to do great things, okay? God's going to speak more, I think, through Victoria, but let's worship, shall we?